taxis, rideshare, and more transportation issues with the guy who knows it all, Dick Falkenberry, right here on Public Exposure. Dick, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. I've, either I know it all or I can fake it all. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about some things that we know that you know. But let's. You sure. wrote a, a column in Crosscut, and it was memo to cab companies. It's all about customer service. What do you mean? It's real simple. Uh, we're seeing a sea change in how we deliver individual rides to people on a, on a random basis in the sense that it unscheduled rides. And what happened is the cab companies for years had a, a virtually monopoly on that service. Mm -hmm. And so people figured out how to use your smartphone apps on the one hand, uh, people's ability to uh, uh, buy cars and, 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 and desire to make a little extra money. Yeah, and Uber like and Lyft and those exactly, rideshare services. Exactly, but what they did was they simply realized that the service that the cab companies provided was so extraordinarily bad. It was, it was not just not good, it was actually almost aggressively bad. Mm -hmm. And they did it because the, the, the cab companies do a service based on the old style, which is you provide a ride and, and, and we take your money. I mean, you, know, you provide ride, take money. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't have any other thought to that except that. And then it's a monopoly, so they don't have to worry about service. And just over the years, the service got worse and worse and worse. Yeah, but it's, it's a monopoly granted to them by city by, authorities. Exactly. Exactly, because nobody knew how to do it otherwise. If you, we tried in the early 80s to simply unregulate cabs. Mm -hmm. We had uh, several hundred more cabs appear and the service didn't get any better because they still had the basic service model. The basic service model is not what people think. As a cab driver, I'm renting the cab from the physical cab, the, the car, from the cab company. Okay, so let's make sure that we get right. this really very clear right. for everybody. Right. This is out of your own experience because exactly. you were a cab driver for exactly. a long time. Exactly. Under the old system. Right. And and this isn't under the table. This is right where everybody can see mm -hmm. it. People think that the cab company is getting a percentage of the ride. Not so at all. What they are getting is simply the rent for the car. They don't care what you do, what kind of service you provide, or even if you provide service. We had people out there doing some very strange things with cabs. Uh, some of them illegal, some of them not illegal. But they, they didn't, the cab company didn't care as long as you paid the rent for the cab. So they began to be less and less. They had absolutely no concern about the service. They so then, actually, in the early, late 70s when I started driving, they didn't want to know what you were doing. So the burden of requiring service or, or a, a good right, ride right. was either upon the consumer or upon the government who was regulating it? No, the, the, uh, there were good drivers. There were surprisingly good drivers. I drove for an outfit called Red Top, and we, mm -hmm. we hired nothing but people that liked to give good service. And, and people would wait two hours for us. So then how come there's bad drivers? Because most people don't care. Uh, Red Top was a very small company with only 30 cabs, I think, out of the 250 or so that were operating in the city. But. The, the cabs right now, I mean, let's take the light rail, for example, that we're spending a bazillion dollars on. Yeah. Whether you like it or whether you're not, we've got it. I think it's two bazillion. Yeah. But if we don't, if we want to take it to the airport, we still right. have like a healthy walk before right. we get there. It's about a thousand feet. Is it, is it accurate to say that the, the cab driver lobby was the one that kept light rail from getting close enough to the airport like it is in every other airport that you know about? No. I think that what they did not actually want to go to the airport. Uh, because they want the parking money from the cars that have to drive to the airport. In other words, so the, airport the Port of Seattle want. wanted that driving, that parking concession. I think that's what actually kept the flight rail out of the out oh, of the okay. terminal. All right, so my mistake, my bad. No, no, no. It's it's just a different approach, but it's still it's still a very very bad call. It was a terrible terrible thing. But seriously though, how is it that these group of cab companies? have a monopoly on this kind of service. Because we didn't see any other way of doing it. The city didn't see it. And then what happened was, in the 60s, a company out called Graytop out in Ballard realized that they were doing all this paperwork every day, figuring out percentages and all that. And they came up with what is called, in the cab industry, nationwide, it's called the Seattle system. And what they said was, we don't care. As long as you give us the rent for the cab, we don't care what you did. So there were nights when I took in several hundred dollars. There were nights when I took in less than what I owed for the cab's rent that night. It was just a series of really bad 
uh, bad karma rides and all of a sudden you're looking at, you're paying for the privilege of driving. So how much does a driver pay for the car? It was $60 a shift when I was there. So two shifts, a day shift, night shift, 120 a night. 120 for each. For two shifts? Course, for two shifts, yeah. And how long is a shift? 12 hours. You're driving for? 12 hours. For 12 hours a The day. really ugly thing was they used to have a thing called a, a euphemism called a single shift where you got the cab for 24 hours and they would let you drive as much as you wanted. Because wow. they could hear you on the radio. Can they still do that now? I don't know. I don't think so. So is, is, that, is that what it is today? It's $60? I'm not sure. I'm, it's been a while since I've driven. And so in the, in the cab company's interest then is in getting as many cabs as they can out there. Right? Within reason, yeah, of course. I mean, at well, some point... But they you, don't care. They don't care if you make $60 or you make $500. Your maintenance problems oh, to, to get to be a problem. So what's the cab company's responsibility? To keep the cars running. Keep That's the cars it. running. Do the, do the cabs pay for the insurance or do the drivers? Yes. They pay for the insurance to dispatch whatever advertising, the phone system, and things. Now, what's happening is the better cab drivers started getting their own cell phones. Pretty soon, they didn't need them. There were cab drivers who used to keep a list of every call. And after a few months, you could figure out a route where you'd pick up from this company. You would pick up their books. They'd take them over to the CPA every morning. And they, they would go to them and say, listen, I'm going to do it with my private car. And because I'm not paying $5,000 a year in insurance, I'm not paying for the dispatcher and all that stuff, I can, give, I can cut my rates in half okay, so and what's still the make money. What's the difference in the rideshare services? For the rideshare service is, first thing, it's, it's you calling the dispatcher who calls the, the closest car available, and that's very key. They don't call the, the car that became available first in that area, which is what the cabs had to do. Because they had to be fair to their drivers. Exactly. I see. But, but, the, but what they've decided is there's going to be enough business that we're simply going to go with the closest person to that, to that call. And then the second thing they do is uh, they, they charge more. So they can demand better service from their, or better, better behavior mm -hmm. from their but drivers. But they're unregulated. They're unregulated, and the problem is mostly insurance. Uh, you hear various stories, but a lot of them are underinsured. So if they get into a very bad accident, uh, it, it can be bad. You can, you, can, you can suffer a lot. Yeah, but you know what? There's an article... Uh, from a few months ago, and we're going to get it up on the screen. It talked about uh, the, I think it's the Uber company. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not a small company. No, no. Two hundred and fifty-seven million dollars is what they raised. And I, I think several of them are based uh, from uh, car companies. I know that the car to go, which is a different matter, but that's that's Mercedes. So what's the issue here then? Uh, I mean, who? How, why is it though that it's it, in a broader picture? Let different. me tell you what it is. Okay. It's it's real simple. It's what we're seeing in a lot of different industries. Suddenly, you have the computerization of the business, so you have both a streamlining. You 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 have fewer people involved, quicker, and everything else. So, like bookstores. I mean, should the city council come in and subsidize bookstores or say, hey, hey, no, no Amazon, no, no eBay books? You know, we've got to protect these little booksellers. Mm -hmm. Or the grocery stores from Amazon Fresh or anything else you want to talk about. And it's kind of interesting that... Well, or Nordstrom from Amazon. Yeah, yeah. And what, of course, some of these people are realizing is that they marry the two together. They have a brick and mortar and they have a, a, a online selling system and it seems to work. There's an article in the paper mm -hmm. about that. So does but the, the right share services... Is, the bigger question is, should the city council be deciding winners and losers on this on this brave new world of, of, of computerized uh, merchandising? Yeah, but the city council does have a, an obligation to protect these the safety of, you know, of the citizens. Absolutely. And, and so by it seems to me by regulating from a safety standpoint, that's very reasonable, isn't it? Yes, I think they can require, just as they require your car to have insurance. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that it's hard to, hard to monitor. For example, there was a, a situation where one of the uh, rideshare programs was driving in San Francisco and hit somebody while he was not actually carrying anybody. He hit a pedestrian and he was not insured. He was insured if he was carrying somebody, but he was not insured if he was not. 
Why can't they just put a QR code that uh, in the, uh, the yeah. windshield of the car right. that shows what the insurance is? That's, be, that'd that's be one, not hard. That's one simple, an even simpler system is simply to raise the gas prices by 25 cents and you automatically buy insurance when you buy gas. That also gives you the opportunity to That's not going to gonna be real popular, i got to tell you. Right, but it also gives you the opportunity. Right now, if you don't drive tomorrow, you don't get any of your insurance money back. Your insurance money is whether you drive one day or 365 so days, and largely de doesn't matter on how many miles you drive. And so one of your biggest costs in transportation, you cannot alter by by cutting back your transportation, by walking to work or whatever you might do. Well, there's, there's going to be an issue on the ballot here in Seattle, and uh, it looks like in August. Look, at Uber put up, what, $200,000 $200, yeah. overnight. Yeah. I mean, just boom, wrote a check. So, they, they so this is, you're right, this is not a mom and pop operation, mm -hmm. and this is not taxis, because taxis never could. So do they provide better service? Absolutely, there's no question about it. So then isn't it in city council's interest to have, again, its citizens have the best service possible? No, because there are people who also want cheap service. So there might be somebody who says, listen, I don't care that I have to wait a half hour for a cab. I, want, I, I, I can't afford Uber's rates. So I think what, you know, again, it, the question is whether you play winner or loser or, mm -hmm. or referee in the, mm -hmm. in the marketplace of, of economy. So you're, you're saying that city council should not choose Nordstrom over Walmart or Walmart over Nordstrom, essentially? And, and more. I mean, I, I would like to see, but for example, we have a rule that your cab can't be older than about seven years old. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I've seen one recently that was... That uh, was that was that young, but uh, no. But I mean, it, it used to be right we, down the street. We used to in nineteen eighties. We would buy cars with over a hundred thousand miles on them, and just run them into the ground, and and all kinds of things. And and we had almost no <clears throat> restrictions on anything. So is the issue that's going to be on the ballot customer service? No, I think it's going to be the question of whether you whether you play referee or not. Okay. Yeah. So I tell you what, let's let's hold that issue for now because sure. it seems like the public are going to be able to decide. Oh yeah, they're going to. Let's go to some headlines. Uh, another link light rail on the rise, and this is the one about uh, Sound Transit's uh, elevated light rail track. Um, well, there seems to be several, but one of them is is to heck ed. I drive by it, but I don't hear a single word about it. Is light rail helping our transportation woes here in the area? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Well, hardly at all. I mean, there, it's it's pretty good if you're a business person going down to the airport with a single briefcase in your hand. And other than that, and, and then young people. But other than that, it is a really not a very efficient system. You can only put 60 people in those cars at a time. Uh, and so... You just add more cars if you have more, more demand for the service. No, but your station is a certain size and you can't... You just can't have it hanging. Actually, it's not the station. It's the stations on the ground. When they're at Othello, if they are too long, then they hang into the intersection. Light rail is called that not because it is ways light. Those cars weigh 100,000 pounds apiece. It is because they have a light capacity. That's where the word light rail comes from. So, it's a light capacity rail. So in other words, it can literally, by definition, never solve your problem. And it probably causes as many problems as it solves by stopping people in Rainier Valley from crossing the valley. It has more stoplights and all that, just like the South uh, uh, Lake Union tr streetcar makes a stop twice as often on Mercer. And that can only hold about 30 people. Well, we've got... And we've got more, more issues coming up. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got more issues coming up because it's all about transportation. We've got this ballot issue that's, that's going to be on in August that we've already talked about. Uh, that's the one with regard to ride share. Right. We have another ballot issue that is uh, before us as we speak. Right. And that's about more funding for Metro, uh, for metro bus system. Right. And, uh, and also some road repair. And road repair? Yeah, there oh. is road repair involved, too. To put more bicycles on? And also some bicycle lanes, yes. Okay. It's not just buses, but it's predominantly buses. Now, the problem with that one is their own uh, analysis shows that their sales taxes revenues are going to go up substantially in the next few years. 
So if their revenues are going to go up, why is that? Because more people are taking the bus? No, the recession is simply, no, no, this is sales tax revenue, not, oh, not I fare. Oh, I see. You see, the, fare, the problem is the fares are only collecting about 25% of costs. So actually, as they get more riders, it actually costs them more tax money to operate the buses. Whoa, run that one by me again. Help me understand that. Okay. If, you're only, if your $2.50 is only covering actually ten, a $10 ride and you get more people, even as you get more fare revenue, you actually generate more demand for more spending to supply the, the ride. So you have to go out and hire new bus, buses, you have to buy new buses, you have to hire new drivers, you have to get more supervisors, you have to have another dispatcher. So from a financial standpoint, we're better off shutting it down? No, from a financial standpoint, you are better keeping it just right at capacity. You, you, you actually don't want to go beyond capacity. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why, for example, they are starting or the, the D ride, the uh, rapid ride. Part of that is to force people to transfer in Ballard to downtown. They come down to the bridge, mm -hmm. they have to transfer. Every study shows that you lose 60% of your ridership when you force them to transfer. It, Metro has had for 25 or 30 years one, one seat per ride. In other words, you get on the bus here and you're going here and you're going to stay on that bus the whole way. That's actually a good plan. Mm -hmm. Because when you do the transfer, people go, ah, I hate this. I, I don't like standing in the rain a second time. I, I miss the bus occasionally. I, I, I did this in the university. I rode the bus to uh, Campus Parkway, which is their central transit center. I got off the bus. There was my bus in front of it. I ran there as the, the bus took off. So I Just guess a minute. It gets better. Oh, the gets driver better. laughed at me. <laughs> and I came back to him and I said, listen, I know it's not you. It's the way this are set up. They don't have communications between the buses. You're going to ask us for more money. You think I'm going to vote for you after you laughed at me for missing the bus? What are you thinking? What in the world are you thinking? Well, that's, that's my question. Um, can this bus system be saved? Has to be. And not for the reason that everybody thinks. Why does it have to the be? The reason why is I've recently been doing some shifts at Safeco Field. I've paid 10 bucks an hour. Now, if I paid the entire fare from my house down to the, on the bus, I would work two hours to be paid for, for eight. In other words, my bus ride to work would cost me two of my eight hours. Well, you think I would come down and work if I was being paid, if I was having to cost $20 to come to work? There's no way. Yeah. So what, the, what happens is DSA and other big employers tell the government you must subsidize and keep low transit costs. And this has been going on since 1900 in the trolley cars. It's why we're willing to subsidize. The reason why we subsidize is so that you're willing to keep your wages low, work for low wages. So, all right, should this pass or should it not? It should definitely not pass. The metro, the, you're talking about metros increase? Yeah. First thing, they don't need it. Secondly, several years ago when we put on the $20 tab, they told us we were, they were gonna increase the number of, of hours. They mm -hmm. did not increase the number of hours by as much as they said they would, not even close, about 50%. So if we keep voting for these levies that turn out not to deliver what they promise, uh, we're just suckers. Hmm. And not only that, but it's also, your, I know, you know, your $150,000 Ferrari is going to pay the same $60 car tab that I am with my $1,000 car, uh, caravan. And sales tax, it's again another sales tax increase, is just more income in inequity. How can we demand $15 an hour minimum wage when we're going after the poor with the most regressive? And they say, well, it's because we must. There's no other way of doing it. The legislature says. But at some point, we should just say no. We simply cannot tax the poor anymore. Hmm. It doesn't work, for okay. one thing. I'm hearing you. All right, let's go on to another issue. Waterfront wishing. Um, you know, a, a, an architect has come up with a really interesting swimming pool and, <laughs> and things down. I mean, you know, sure. you're laughing, but it's a really nice picture, and we're going to get this up on the screen. And my, my question is, is that from a transportation standpoint, is there, 
a possibility of being enough people that can go there to be able to make this work? Uh, for one thing, as somebody pointed out, all the pictures are taken on a nice sunny day with people walking around in the nice sunny, broad sunshine and things mm -hmm. like that. Sure. I would also like to see us reconnect with the waterfront in a more working class way rather than an entertainment way. What I would like to see at Pier 60, which is the one pier north of the aquarium where we used to have the concerts mm -hmm. on the pier, I would like to see us have a huge fresh seafood market there where you would buy directly from the boats and no other way. Then we would not bring in fish from Alaska. We would not bring in lobsters from Maine. These would be local fishermen working in Puget Sound, working maybe out on the coast. And we would have restaurants starting with simple fish and chips to great sushi to a really fine, elegant white tablecloth. But we already we, have that. Not in one place and not directly off the boats. There's no way they could justify $8 fish and chips if they're buying it. Fishermen are getting less than a dollar a pound for their fish, and they're selling it at wholesale. And, and yet, we're at the market, it's 5 and $6 a pound. We could go down there. You can go down underneath the First Avenue South Bridge for the Native Americans in July and August and buy salmon for as little as a dollar a pound and most of the time, 2 or $3 a pound. We could have a thing where you have a nitrogen freezer. You freeze it, boom, it's as fresh as when you take it home and thaw it. We could have a, a special shop there to teach you how to cook fish better. We could have a spice shop. I'm, I'm imagining an entire huge, like the Fulton Street fish market used to be in, in New York City. Hmm. Well, we have all sorts of other transportation issues, but it really right. comes down to this. The, the viaduct crack signal a state race against time. Bertha to get moving again. Let's, let's talk about that. The viaduct is coming down one way or another, according to this article. And um, Bertha is the, the thing that's going to get us there, right? No, it's stuck. It's stuck, and it appears to be a major sort of significant inbred problem in, in the sense that this is not a tooth that fell off or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. This is a, a design in the seal that less than a tenth of the way in started to accept uh, dirt and grit and other things into that seal and cause it to seize. What we should do right now is declare that we have made a gigantic mistake and stop it. This well, should be one of the largest projects. What, no, you don't. Here it is. September 1st is the goal for the restart of, of tunneling. And that's, uh, that's and just, as, that's as we talked about this on April the 13th. Whistling past the graveyard. But here's the question that I have, though. Drills, this is Bertha's deep trouble started in Japan. It started from the design stage. Apparently, they didn't even test the, uh, the uh, thing when they found out there was a problem. They fixed, fixed it, and then they didn't even retest it. This is a, 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 this is a cultural thing in whoever's building this, but, but it's worse than that. What they're going to do is they're going to dig a huge pit, and they're going to pull the machine out and fix it. The problem is, first thing, why didn't they design it so that you could fix the thing from both sides in a very small area? Secondly, what are you going to do when you're underneath a building? And this machine is stuck. The third thing is your headline there, the viaduct cracks. We're not even underneath the viaduct and we're settling. It's settling only four tenths of an inch. The problem is this viaduct can settle because all you're doing is running a car over it. But what are you going to do when you're underneath a major building and it settles a little bit? And finally, we're going to go within 200 feet or so of the federal building. Mm -hmm. They have already sent us a letter saying we are very nervous about this. You've got to remember, when they built the railroad tunnel in 1905, they had to rebuild re the foundations on the library, which is where the current library is. They had to jack up the building and rebuild the foundations, and it was 360 feet above the tunnel. Don't we have enough money to pay for it? We, I mean, we do. But, but, We've got it in the budget, right? A, but, but there's a punchline to all this. Yeah. Nobody who was doing the work on this tunnel went down to the Seattle Public Library and asked for the records on what had happened in the 1905 tunnel. They did not do dil due diligence. They were going to dig this tunnel no matter what. The good news is that if we stop this project right now, we're still under warranty. 
we virtually have to pay nothing. I mean, relatively speaking, we have to pay nothing. We should do this. It take, it's going to take a tremendous amount of courage. Dick, you it's are going to a take veteran. a tremendous amount of courage, but somebody should step forward and say, I am going to order a stop to this right now. You are a veteran of the political wars here in this area. <laughs> Have wounded, you wounded ever, wounded ever known, uh, since Governor Rosalini, yeah. have you ever known anyone with the political courage mm -hmm. to say no to this? Yeah. Whoops. Washington Power and Supply. So do we for those for those in your audience who are too young to remember this, in the late sixties we were gonna build five simultaneously build five nuclear power plants. And when we decided to pull the plug, we had the largest bond default in the history of the United States, maybe in the world. And they told us, oh my God, this will ruin our rating. We can never go back in the state of Washington or any entity within the state. Five years later, Washington Power and Supply goes back to Wall Street and they had not to pay one penalty on their interest rates. This will be viewed as the wise thing to do once it's done. Who's going to do it? It should be Ed Murray. Ed Murray could declare that one of the most interesting things is we have a lot of power to do things in the name of public health. Ron Sims on executive fiat ordered us to have a bicycle helmet law because the kids that were crashing on their bikes without a helmet created a public health hazard. And he ordered them to put a thing on the King County uh, boards that says, you will wear helmets. Ed Murray can declare, I am concerned that this tunnel is going to cause collapse and calamity, and I am going to order it stopped right now. Do you think that's going to happen? No. No. Is there anybody else? The, the governor could, but he won't do it. We've got 15 seconds left. The traffic and uh, uh, the, the major traffic solution here is what? Smart cars. Smart cars. Smart cars that don't get into accidents. Accidents and breakdowns cause 60% of your congestion. When they don't get into accidents, you're going to see a lot of this go away. All right, so the next time Dick Falkenberry's on public exposure, we're going to be talking smart cars. We'll see you next time right here. Take care.